The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Tools of the Trade, a practical guide to managing NASH. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ACR 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hello, this is Dr. Jay Schubert from Toro University of California in Vallejo, California. Welcome to this educational activity focused on providing practical guidance from screening and diagnosis to the management of patients with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Included as part of this activity, I will be showing you how to use some of the practice aids that you can download with the hopes of helping you address clinical challenges that you may encounter in your clinical practice or that might support some of the discussions that you're having with your patients. So let's talk about what non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is. And this is important because the definition is really defining a spectrum of conditions. So first of all, it can start with simple steatosis, greater than 5% fat in the hepatocytes, without any other problems, all the way to NASH, where we actually see evidence of hepatosteatosis, inflammation, and actually ballooning with cellular fibrosis. And this is really important that we identify where a person is in the spectrum. The definition of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease makes the assumption that there is no significant recent alcohol consumption and no other known causes of liver disease. And I suspect in the future that this name will change really to metabolic liver disease as opposed to non-alcoholic because it, the name is somewhat assumptive that we used to think that our patients were drinking alcohol based upon their lab values when they really weren't. When we look at that progression, just having fat in the liver may or may not be clinically significant. It's when the fat in this liver contributes to these other processes, such as lobular inflammation, ballooning with fibrosis, that's when we start to see problems, and that's when we're really looking at concerns for the downstream liver effects of cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. So what's the epidemiology of NAFLD? We know that you know, about 25% of the population has NAFLD, and if we look at the most severe portion of NAFLD, NASH, it's somewhere between 10 and 14, or 12 and 14 percent. And I want to highlight that that's about the same rate or even a little bit higher than what we see in diabetes. So this is a common condition. And we know that we see the highest prevalence in groups like in the Middle Eastern countries. And so this is something that we're going to continue to see more and more of. And we know that it's been tied to both truncal and visceral obesity, such that those who are obese are seeing evidence of NASH 25 to 30%, and those with diabetes that have truncal obesity have 30 to 40% uh, prevalence of NASH. How does this affect primary care? We know that a recent study in outpatient family medicine, internal medicine, and endocrine clinics, wholly, nearly 70% of people with type 2 diabetes had NAFLD, as marked by steatosis, and 15% had clinically significant liver fibrosis. And so this is really something that you're seeing quite regularly. And sadly, many people find out about their NAFLD at the time they find out that they have fibrosis or cirrhosis. And we do expect the prevalence of NAFLD to continue to increase with a disproportionate increase in those patients with advanced disease. So as we look at this, we really need to start thinking about how do we identify our patients how do we identify them before they have NASH? And how can we potentially reduce the potential significant liver disease that's associated with NASH? So let's look at the natural history of NAFLD. And I think this is important as we're looking at the top graphics, we're really looking at the liver-centric part. We know there's 60 to 80 million Americans with NAFLD, probably quite more because we don't identify everyone. There's a portion of them that have NASH. And if you look at those patients who have NASH, over the next three years, up to a third of them are going to start developing fibrosis with a rate of uh, advancing of the stage every seven years. And from those patients who start to develop fibrosis, they're going to start going on a pathway to the right, potentially over to cirrhosis or downward to hepatocellular carcinoma. And these are two very serious but largely preventable conditions for people with NAFLD. Now, that being said, 
liver disease is not the number one killer of people with NAFLD and NASH. The number one killer is cardiovascular disease. And so while it's very important that we look at preventing the progression from NAFLD to NASH to fibrosis, we also have to take a whole body approach and say, not only am I trying to protect the liver from cirrhosis and cancer, I need to prevent this person from having unintended increased cardiovascular disease. So let's talk a little bit about the risk factors for NAFLD and NASH. And it's important that we know that this is a metabolic condition. And so you're going to see many of the same risk factors you see with type 2 diabetes. Many of the people who are at risk are going to be overweight or obese, and particularly having truncal obesity consistent with metabolic syndrome. We know that people with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes are at very significant increased risk, and they have diabetic dyslipidemia, which is defined as high triglycerides and low HDL. And so we're going to come back to this metabolic syndrome features when we talk about who should we screen for NAFLD and NASH. And so let's talk about where NAFLD fits in a systemic disease, because it's not just a disease of the liver. We've mentioned that the predisposing risk factors include many of the same things that we see for metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes, including excessive weight, the abnormality in managing glucose and blood pressure and lipids. And those things all contribute on a background of genetic risk to metabolic stress. And when we look at that metabolic stress, it can affect all parts of our body. We know that type 2 diabetes is a multi-system condition, and so is NAFLD. So you can see there's changes in terms of the vascular bed, in terms of hypertension and coronary artery disease. You can see that you have problems with the myocytes and heart failure. You certainly see both liver and pancreas abnormalities as it relates to managing glucose, insulin, and free fatty acids. Certainly you see beta cell dysfunction in the pancreas. And then the adipose tissue becomes inflammatory as a contributor and leads to further dysregulated lipolysis. And then ultimately, the kidney as a vascular organ will also start to see abnormalities. And so what's that look like in real life? And, and you know, we as humans have the ability to have a wide range of dietary and, and activity components and really not notice anything. But those people who are at risk are really going to start to see problems with their metabolic flexibility. When things are lined up and our energy input equals our energy output, maybe everything's okay and we don't see excessive storage of fat. But if we have an increase in, in intake or a decrease in output in those people at risk, we're not only gaining weight, but we're also starting to store fat and glucose in areas where it doesn't belong. And that's going to start to lead to problems where we're going to have abnormal fuel substrate, abnormal sensitivity, and abnormal utilization. And this is just kind of a marker of how the organs are kind of tied together. And this is really quite important. I think of type 2 diabetes as a liver disease. And so I know that either glucose or free fatty acids can affect the signaling at the liver in the bottom there. So if you have an increase in free fatty acids, you start to see an increase in lipotoxic load in the liver, and you start to see an abnormality in the way it handles both glucose and fat. And you can actually see from both of those an increase in de novo lipogenesis or an increase of fat above and beyond what you need. When you have those conditions, you can also see that the fat organs are no longer storing molecules. They're actually not responding normally to the free fatty acids, which then get released. And then those also contribute to this pathway. Looking at the skeletal muscles, which are really our burners, you can see that they become less efficient as burners with reducing fat oxidation and reducing glucose clearance when you start to see insulin resistance. So these things are all working together and you start to have dis uh, dysfunction in one, you're gonna have dysfunction in the whole system. So let's tie that down just a little bit further. Our patients who are at risk may have insulin resistance. You start to see free fatty acid overload that's going to cause stress within the organs, and you're going to start to see an, inflate, an increase in inflammatory cytokines. This is going to result in a mitochondrial dysfunction, which is our generators of our body, and ultimately you're going to start to see an organ damage in terms of increase in insulin resistance, an increase in lipotoxicity, and then that's going to feed back into that inflammatory system and just create that cycle round and round. So then let's go back to that, that, that whole body approach. We've already talked about the genetic, 
the, the, and the dietary and physical activity components of metabolic inflexibility, we then start to see that it affects the organs, like steatosis in the liver. You, so you might get inflammation and fibrosis. You're going to start seeing uh, accumulation uh, along the vascular beds, which can lead to atherosclerosis. You're going to see a decrease in lip lipid oxidation and inflammation that's going to affect contract uh, contractile function at the heart, and you're going to start to see apoptosis of cells because they're no longer responding normally. These things all lead not only to just cellular damage, but organ damage. And so you start to see the um, joining of things like diabetes, fatty liver disease, and cardiovascular disease all feeding on each other from that same uh, metabolic inflexibility and stress as it results from that. So let's go from this pathophysiology to making a timely diagnosis. And this is really important. Uh, you know, when I started doing family medicine, I actually felt like we didn't really have good guidance on how to diagnose NASH. So I was waiting for people who had elevated transaminases or maybe just uh, finding a fat on some imaging scan. But we know that's not, not adequate. So when we diagnose non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, it's important to remember that most patients are going to be asymptomatic. And if they do have symptoms, they're going to be vague symptoms. They're not specific to fatty liver disease. So we really have to rely on evidence-based screening programs to have a way to identify our patients that are at risk. And it's got to do something better than what we were doing before, which is just the elevated transaminases and incidental finding of fat on, on imaging. So when we're diagnosing fatty liver disease, it's important for us to be able to say, yes, I, th I see it in terms of steatosis. Yes, I can rule out other causes. And then I need to determine how progressive it is. And it's really important for us to be able to identify that. Because otherwise, we'd be sending all of these patients to liver biopsy. And that, that really was my early experience with NAFLD and NASH. And that's not, one, reasonable, and two, an effective strategy. So we need to find a way to triage our patients so we know who's at higher, highest risk, who will actually need a liver biopsy. So what are the screening recommendations? So the screening reductions are really tend to say who are our highest risk groups who are going to benefit from systematic screening. And when we have that, are we able to separate the low-risk people from the high-risk people? So down looking at the green box, you can see that all patients with type 2 diabetes are recommended now to be screened for NAFLD and NASH. And we'll talk about how to do that. Patients who have two or more metabolic risk factors, so almost have metabolic syndrome, should also be screened universally. Because again, we really think of this as the same pathophysiologic process. There are many other patients who could be screened, but those are the two groups that we feel are most important and should be screened universally. And then thirdly, we're going to find a number of patients who are at risk because we incidentally find uh, transaminitis or hepatic steatosis on imaging scans. And that's not enough to make a diagnosis, but it is enough evidence that we should screen them for NAFLD and NASH. So you, let's say you find someone with incidental transaminitis or in excessive fat on their um, imaging scan. It is really important that we screen for other causes. And the most common other cause is certainly increase or excessive alcohol intake. It's more than two drinks per day in women or more than three drinks per day in men. We'll actually talk about the lower levels are actually recommended in people who are at risk. Make sure you don't see any clinical signs of advanced liver disease, such as cirrhosis or um, jugular venous distension or other edema. And then we generally recommend that you're screening for both viral and autoimmune hepatitis. And typically those conditions have much higher levels of transam transaminases, but I think it's important to at least look for them, particularly in our baby boomers who are really at high risk for hepatitis C. And then finally, because we are looking at um, a group of patients who have insulin resistance, it's also important to look for hemochromatosis. Uh, and again, these are things that are quite easy to screen for and are generally readily apparent. Now, when you do screening for NAFLD and NASH, we're going to talk about the FIB4. And what we will have is a test that is non-invasive, that's easily obtained, and not too expensive. All you need is a CBC and either a CMP or liver function tests. Because if you have the patient's age, 
AST, ALT, and platelets, you're able to do screening in the primary care setting. And so we know that these are things that you're probably already getting. And so do your regular history and physical. If you're concerned about fatty liver disease, which you should be for any of those patients we mentioned are at risk, these are the tests you can order. Let's talk about a case. Ted is a 51-year-old male who has type 2 diabetes and a BMI of 32. Uh, so you do lab work from his annual physical, and you see that there's elevated transaminitis. Ted's in the clinic today for a follow-up visit, and those levels are still elevated. And you ask Ted, does he have any history of liver disease? Has he had any uh, regular habitual intake? And he says no to these things. So which of the following things are you going to do next for this patient? So when we're taking a, a situation as we just described, I think a Fib4 is a really excellent first step for this person. You've already taken the time to make sure alcohol is not the issue, and he doesn't have any baseline history of um, other liver diseases, and his transaminases are mildly elevated, so you're really not suspecting viral hepatitis. So we know with an age, an AST, an ALT, and platelets, we can calculate very easily a Fib4 score. Now his Fib4 score is 3.2, and we'll talk a little bit more about that score, but what are you going to do in response to an, a Fib4 score of 3.2? Again, the goal here is to be able to find ways that we can help people get to the right care that they need specific to their level of risk. So when we look at the FIB4 score, you can see that a FIB4 score less than 1.3 is relatively low risk for advancing to fibrosis and cirrhosis. That does not mean that they don't have steatosis. It just means their risk of progressing is relatively low. For those patients, if their score is low, you can repeat this non-invasive testing in two or three years unless there's been some substantial change in their clinical scenario. Conversely, if their FIB4 score is above 2.67, they are really considered very high risk. And they're the ones really that should have, don't pass go, go directly to hepatology. Now I will tell you in my practice, it really depends on the hepatologist that you have and the resources you have. So if my hepatologist is busy, I might do them a favor and order a liver stiffness measurement test first while I'm waiting for that referral. But I'm going to do that referral right away because I want them to have access to immediate treatment. And so low risk is going to probably stay in the primary care uh, space. High risk is going to go to hepatology. It's the indeterminate risk that really is the challenge. And of course, this is a screening test that has both false positives and false negatives. And so in this indeterminate risk, it's really important for us to do a little bit more to assess their overall risk. If we do that, the next best test is not a plain ultrasound, but actually a measure of liver stiffness. And so you could do something such as a fibroscan or a, a vibration control trans transient elastography. So what this does is using ultrasound, but also looking at the stiffness of the liver. And so this is really important because again, if the liver's stiff, then we have a problem. So if you have someone in the low risk, I'm probably not going to do my liver stiffness test. If they're in the indeterminate risk, and now I get to the liver stiffness test, and it shows less than eight, I put them now back into the low risk group, and I'll do uh, non-invasive non -invasive testing in two to three years. If they're in the high risk, I've further confirmed they're very high risk, and I'm going to get them to hepatology immediately because these are our patients that really are at greatest risk for liver and cardiovascular complications. Once again, there is this middle space, the indeterminate risk, and I will tell you, at least in my practice, I am sending them to hepatology as well until I get a sense of you know, where the hepatologist uh, and what the hepatologist is able to do. But because this, is a, this may be a population that may be more than our hepatologist can handle, I think you set up a referral, but you may need to continue monitoring and reevaluate risk in the primary care setting. So low risk stays in the primary care setting, high risk goes to hepatology, and this indeterminate risk will really depend on the liver stiffness measurement where they go. So now we're going to put these things together using the pathophysiology and the AGA NASH clinical care pathway
to really inform management now that we have a low risk group, an indeterminate group, and a high risk group, because the treatment is slightly different with each of these groups. So what are the key things that we want you to know? The most important thing that we want to do here is use screening to make sure that we do the right amount of treatment to the right patients. And we want to make sure that we don't forget that we're treating not only the liver, but we're also treating cardiovascular disease and the other things associated with diabetes. And at least in my neighborhood, I don't have enough hepatologists to be able to see everybody with fatty liver disease. So being able to triage patients is really going to help us get the patients who need the care the most to specialty care. So it's determined that Ted, when he has his liver stiffness and let's say he went on and had a biopsy, he has stage two fibrosis. Is pharmacotherapy for NASH warranted at this time for Ted? Do you think yes, no, or I'm not sure? So when we look at the treatment of people who, are, uh, who have NASH, we're going to, again, look at the treatment based upon their risk. And I, I want to highlight that Ted is already in the high-risk group, but I'm jumping back to the low-risk group. If someone has NAFLD and they're in the low-risk group, the most important thing we want to do is focus on lifestyle intervention. This lifestyle intervention is basically looking at a whole food diet, certainly limiting processed foods, limiting high fructose corn syrup. When you look at dietary uh, outcomes, you can see that um, there are many different dietary interventions you could use. Again, Mediterranean diet has good evidence, but you can see that the DASH diet has also shown some improvement as well as some of the low carbohydrate diets. So you're able to individualize and work with your patient to a dietary plan that they're able to do, but please look at the evidence and so that we're able to pick a diet that one, will meet their needs, and two, be able to give them the benefit that you think they're going to need. And I really do want to highlight that, that you know, for an AFLD, very low calorie diets work quite well as well. They're just harder to maintain. Weight loss is the other really important part of this. And with weight loss, you can see a dramatic change in the person's risk of advancing through the stages and actually also the risk of advancing through fibrosis. Even a small amount of weight loss, 5%, can cause a reversal of steatosis, and a 10% weight loss can actually improve NASH or early fibrosis. So we don't need to lose 100 pounds. You know, for many people, it's just a 5 to 10% weight loss, and setting a reasonable goal might be beneficial for them. If patients are unable to achieve this with lifestyle, please consider weight loss medications or metabolic surgery. And we know that physical activity is better at maintaining weight loss than causing weight loss, but it is a significant contributor to reducing cardiovascular risk in our patients. And there was just another study done this weekend showing that 10,000 steps can reduce cardiovascular risk in people with prediabetes and type 2 diabetes. And what does that look like? You're trying to get you know, somewhere between 150 and 300 minutes of moderate intensity exercise every week or 75 to 150 minutes of vigorous exercise every week. Now, if your patients are not already active, you're not gonna start at this level. You gotta meet them where they're at and do one step at a time and build up to that because you want them to be successful over the long haul. Because the number one cause of death in people with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease is cardiovascular disease, you wanna do all the normal things you would take, do for this population to reduce their cardiovascular risk. Dietary, we mentioned, physical activity is a big part of that. Weight loss, and then please remember you're going to do all your primary or secondary cardiovascular preventions, such as statins. Many people are afraid to use statins when you see elevated transaminases, but there's really good evidence that statins not only are safe, but they're probably even helpful for many of our patients with fatty liver disease. And so utilizing them even in the low risk group and higher risk group is still recommended pharmacotherapy for NASH. Um, certainly you can use agents that I'll be talking about in the future, but you do not need to use specific agents. And while you're going to see uh, an increased use of GLP-1 receptor agonists and SGLT2 inhibitors, we know that um, these agents might also be beneficial in NASH, but we're also going to talk about pioglitazone and its benefits for NASH as well. So treat your patient with diabetes how you would treat them outside of fatty liver disease, 
but we're going to talk a little bit more about how these agents can provide additional help. And this is the new and simplified ADA algorithm. Um, I hope you're chuckling because this doesn't look very simplified to me, but I would highlight to you that we do have um, very specific pathways that if our patient has uh, on the left-hand side atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or high risk, heart failure, or chronic kidney disease, we might utilize very specific agents because of their extraglycemic benefits. And someday, when, if I'm king, we're going to have a, a column for, for fatty liver disease and NASH as well, because we know that there are specific agents that are, are, are specifically beneficial. If, you're not, if, a, if your patient doesn't have any of those specific indications, I might recommend that you consider the middle pathway on the right, that our patients with, uh, with NASH and type 2 diabetes, that we're really focusing on minimizing weight gain and promoting weight loss. And again, you can see which agents have really provided you with the most benefit for that. So now I'm going to jump to the high risk, and Ted was in, a, in our high risk group. We know that our patients who have um, high Fib4 scores and high liver stiffness measurements or FibroSense scores, they typically have higher risk for advanced fibrosis and cirrhosis, and they're at high risk for hepatocellular cancer. So again, in the primary care space, we're still going to recommend all those things that we recommended before as it relates to lifestyle change and weight loss. So that, that's no different across the groups. But I am going to get them to a hepatologist as early as possible so that if there's liver-specific therapy that can be given, we want to make sure they have access to that. And I might, in the primary care space, suggest a more aggressive approach about doing lifestyle and either pharmacotherapy or metabolic surgery. Because again, time is not our friend in these metabolic conditions. So what about Ted? We already talked about that he's going to need to um, have some additional treatment. He's going to go to hepatology. He's got stage 2 fibrosis and type 2 diabetes. What do you recommend for treatment? And I maybe let the cat out of the bag a little bit early. I think yes, absolutely, for our patients with indeterminate and high risk uh, Fib4 or uh, FibroScan scores, you're going to choose agents with proven study benefit for NAFLD and NASH, and particularly NASH. And this is really important because we know that there are treatments that can reduce the progression and maybe even reverse progression of early fibrosis. I do want to say that no current treatment is FDA approved for the treatment of NASH today. And so we'll be using these off label. But that being said, as I mentioned earlier, pioglitazone has got shown, proven benefits for slowing the progression of fatty liver disease and NASH. GLP-1 receptor agonists have early data to actually also show histologic improvement, even in patients with or without diabetes. And of those, semaglutide has the most data to point. But I think, quite honestly, any of these agents that can contribute to significant weight loss is likely to be beneficial. Now, I do want to highlight that vitamin E was one of your choices, and vitamin E is considered a treatment for NASH, but really in the subgroup that doesn't have type 2 diabetes, because we see better benefit in those groups, and we have other treatments available for our patients with type 2 diabetes. So vitamin E for the group without diabetes, people like Ted who have type 2 diabetes, you're going to do all those treatments I mentioned, plus consider the use of a, a pioglitazone or a GLP-1. Stay tuned, there will be more therapies coming. And this is really the current potential therapeutic tar targets for NASH, and it's really exciting. As we've learned more about the pathophysiology, we've got a number of different pathways that we could utilize to address NASH. Now, none of these are available today, but some are coming, and I just think this is a yet another reason why you want to get your patients to hepatology, so that when studies become available or new treatments become available, your patients will have early access to those treatments. And that's one of the most critical points of getting patients at the highest risk to hepatology. Now, when you look at the glucose-lowering drugs, I, I've highlighted this already. What I want to make sure you know here is that when you look at the drugs and their effects, you know, metformin does reduce hepatic gluconeogenesis, so that's great for lowering fasting glucose. It's relatively neutral for cardiovascular benefits and it's relatively neutral for both transaminases and liver fat content and, and NASH resolution. So it doesn't mean you can't use this, but you're just not going to get any additional liver benefit from it. 
Pagluzone, which is a PPAR agonist, you can see that you get substantial as one of the strongest agents to improve insulin sensitivity. You get better glucose control and quite honestly, great durability. It is associated with weight loss, largely through fluid, and at least for the overall cardiovascular system, it's neutral, but there is some secondary benefit for stroke. But where you see benefits at the liver is a reduction in fat content, liver enzymes, NASH resolution, and even early fibrosis benefit. So again, you have to match the risk-benefit profile for your patients, but absolutely, this is one of the treatments that are available. When you look at sulfonylureas, you're gonna see they're neutral across the board. So again, this is an agent that only treats glucose. DPP-4 inhibitors, while they do affect the incretin system, they're gonna be beneficial for glucose control, but they're gonna be neutral generally for the great majority of your patients with NASH. Unlike the GLP-1 receptor agonists that are pharmacologic effects in the incretin system, where they have significant benefit uh, for glucose, and they have weight loss, which may be part of the driver, but not the only driver for improving both cardioprotection effects and reduction in fat liver, transaminases, NASH resolution, and even uh, changing early liver fibrosis. And now there's some data looking at SGLT2 inhibitors that might also be beneficial for the liver, but I don't think we have quite enough data yet to be able to recommend this group, but certainly there doesn't seem to be any liver risk effects from SGLT2 inhibitors. Finally, we still have to do all our normal work for our patients at high risk for cardiovascular risk reduction. So please, even though the hepatologist might be doing liver-specific treatments, you still need to work on cardiovascular risk reduction. It's still the number one thing that's going to kill them. And you, when you look at diabetes-specific care, there is a recommendation of targeted therapy, including pioglitazone and a GLP-1 receptor agonist for those patients. Now let's go back to that indeterminate risk. And that indeterminate risk, as I already mentioned, if they are indeterminate on the FIB4 score, and you take them down to the lip fiber scan, and they're still indeterminate, you have to decide, are you gonna manage these patients? And if you are, you're gonna do all the things I've mentioned for the other groups, but you are gonna probably do more aggressive weight loss, and you're gonna do specific pharmacotherapy. If you're gonna refer them to hepatology, you're still gonna to wanna to do all those things that you mentioned on the primary care side, but you're gonna get them earlier access. And I think currently, until you get comfortable seeing more patients, you know, it might be better to send these indeterminate risk at the second stage to hepatology so that they can then put them in trials and again, give them uh, targeted access to liver specific treatments. So today we talked about a lot of things. NAFLD and its more serious component, NASH, are much more common than we think. In fact, they might be more common than diabetes and they're probably gonna be the next wave of metabolic disease, just like we see diabetes today. I think it's important to remember that traditional markers such as transaminitis and steatosis on imaging do not adequately assess risk. They certainly can show that there's fat, but it doesn't tell us who's at highest risk for advancing. We do have guidelines from the AGA and recently from the Endocrine Society, and they do recommend that we screen patients who we know are at the greatest risk those with metabolic syndrome features, as well as those with type 2 diabetes. And when we look at treatment, we need to be both looking at the liver, what can we do to prevent fibrosis and cirrhosis and hepatocellular cancer, but we also much have to look at the entire body and how do we reduce the, the thing that kills most people, which is cardiovascular disease. And I really think in many respects, because we know so much now, and we have guidelines now that can really help us navigate you're gonna be able to do more for your patients. Since implementing these guidelines in my practice, I actually am referring less people to hepatology than I was before, because I'm able to identify who are the low risk and who are the high risk patients. And because we have many novel therapies on the horizon, I suspect you're gonna see a very exciting time for the treatment of NAFLD and NASH in the future and getting our highest risk patients to hepatology so they get access to early trials and early treatment is really important. And then finally, as I say all the time in diabetes, you don't have to go it alone. We know that this is a team approach. So certainly you're working with your patients, but partner with nutritionists, dietitians, endocrinologists, diabetes educators, cardiologists, hepatologists, so that we as a team can address all those things because it's so hard to do all of this at once. And this is a place where being a lumper 
thinking all of this is cardiovascular disease is better than being a splitter that I'm treating seven different conditions. I'm treating a bunch of things that all lead to cardiovascular outcomes. And by doing that and doing it as a group, you're really able to better serve your patients. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash ACR 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Novo Nordisk Incorporated.